Hi, I'm Vitek, and today I will talk a little bit about design patterns in Elixir. So, uh, throughout the last few months, I have been working on Membrane, and coming from more object-oriented languages into Elixir was quite hard, to say the least. Uh, this is how my first PR looked like, or this is more accurate description of it. Uh, so, the reason well, why uh, that was the case is because the object-oriented design patterns that I knew from other languages didn't uh, translate that well into uh, functional programming. Uh, so the reason why was that in the functional world we use a little bit different uh, approaches to many things. But half a year later, uh, I was working on some object-oriented uh, st stuff for my uni coursework. And I found out that the design patterns used out there can be some kind of translated into Elixir. Most notably, those two, the observer pattern and the strategy one. So let's look how we can do that. So first talk about what is the observer pattern. So when we talk about observer pattern, we have some kind of object that state is changing, and other objects react to those changes. And instead of well, manually sending all these, managing all these states, uh, we can have a simple solution that uh, will allow other objects to subscribe for any of those changes. So uh, the problem I was solving was a simple uh, evolution simulation where there were a lot of animals on some kind of map that transformed their state, and you need a lot of other components to get notification from that transform state. So uh, in Elixir, we can do that with using processes, and other processes can subscribe to the ones that are the states are transformed, and with allowing simple interface for subscription and unsubscription, uh, and the simple notification uh, function, we can simply send any uh, information about the changes of the state. So the next pattern was the strategy. So strategy pattern is when we have uh, some stuff to do, but in different conditions we want to do it in different ways. But from, but from what we call this, we don't actually want to uh, interact with that how, how we actually do that. So in Elixir, we have two ways to do that. The first one is through behaviors. This is a very common approach. You can see it in other languages as well. You just define some behavior, which is like interface or trace from other languages, and then just implement it. Nothing special there. You can keep the module reference uh, in your state and just call these functions, and it will work. But there is more Elixir way to do that uh, with author matching. Uh, you can actually have multiple functions uh, which uh, match based on the type that you defined. And with that strategy, uh, being placed inside the object, you can basically call those functions and match on them and execute the proper algorithm. But with that type definition and posture matching, we get a little bit into the functional world. So let's take a little dive there. So the main things in functional programming are functions. And composing them in different ways is like uh, building Legos. You can uh, attach them in different ways to get different results. And uh, the main part of why Legos are so fun to play with is because you can build multiple things. And you can build multiple things because the Legos are linked with each other. So you can basically attach them in any way you want. And that's why you want to have functional programming, the pure functions that are not linked with each other, and they just take some input and take some, produce some output. And with types, you can actually define what inputs they can have and what 
outputs they produce, and that's how you can link them. So chaining functions is quite common. You've probably seen something like this a lot of the time, uh, programming in Elixir, even in previous presentation. But there comes a twist when we want to return something that isn't simply value, but something like result. Uh, returning the OK or error tuple from uh, the function is probably what anyone uh, programming in Elixir seen at some point. And you can just pipe them uh, into the other functions. So what we can do, do with them. So the first thing uh, that comes to mind is spaghetti code ha uh, error handling. And you don't have to program in Elixir to see that this isn't the most readable solution. And the proper one, or the more uh, beautiful looking one, uh, would be something like this, using with dual else from uh, Elixir standard library, uh, where you can separate all the logic related to computations with the return logic and all the hel error handling. But it's still not the greatest case because we still, the result from the first function have to assign to some variable just to use it in, in the second line and so on and so on. So we can modify it a little bit and firstly define some simple chain function that will match on those results and based on that it will either execute a function or pass of the, an error further. And right now you can just chain functions just like you would do uh, if those functions wouldn't return the result, but uh, with that you can actually handle the, the, the errors that you want to handle. But all of that was mostly to do things in a beautiful way, but uh, what we really want to do in Elixir is continuous execution of the program. So remember, why do you even started using Elixir in the first place? It's mostly likely because uh, your team wanted to uh, execute some tasks concurrently, or you want to build some web scale application, or you wanted to build some fault tolerance system. Or the other reason is ju you just watch around the movie SQL and got hooked. Uh, before I move on, there is a quick disclaimer. The rest of this presentation was most likely stalled from uh, Dave and Aston from the Lambda days. But this is what Joseph did with Erlang anyway, so <laughs> 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 let's move on. So the first part so the first pattern is uh, embarrassingly parallel. Uh, you basically have some process that have some jobs to do and they are independent of each other. You, you, so uh, in Elixir, you can just spawn other processes, assign the job to them, and make things done. Uh, the things for, first thing that we uh, notice here is that the jobs are independent of each other, and they don't communicate back into the parent process. So how would you do that, something like this in Elixir? So imagine you have some list of paths to files that you want to transform in some way. Here we do convolution on them. So instead of doing just you know map on each of this uh, and doing it in one process, we can just spawn new processes for all of these uh, files and execute it concurrently. Job done. So when we want to use it, uh, firstly we need independent evaluation of each of those functions. Uh, we need no communication with parent or with between siblings, and there are no shared dependencies between those siblings. If any of those are violated, you probably don't want to use it. Uh, the next pattern is quite common. Uh, you've probably step on them in other languages. Uh, it's called reduction or async await. Uh, and this is similar to the previous one, but in this case, after doing the parallel job, uh, we have some reduction state st uh, step where we merge the results from the previous jobs or some can combine them. And in this case, we also can spawn the child, child processes, do the job there, and get the result back to the parent process and do the reduction. So 
the same little modified example from the previous one uh, is when we actually transform those images instead of just saving them or forgetting about them, we want to merge them into the video. So right now we not only need to transform those images, but get the result back and merge it in some way. So here we can use a task async from the standard, standard library, uh, do the convolution uh, on them, spawn the new process, uh, get the ref, wait on that ref uh, for set period of time, here we specify infinity, and then pass the result into the uh, merging function. So when we want to use it. Uh, so again, we have independent evaluation of each of those jobs. Uh, we have communication with the parent, but there are no communications between, there are no communications between children and there are no shared dependencies between them. Okay, so the last uh, design pattern I want to talk about is pipeline processing. And from the previous presentation, you probably can uh, have a few ideas where I'm going with this. So in pipeline processing, we have some kind of procedure, uh, producer nodes, some producer consumer nodes, and the last consumer node, or there can be multiple consumer nodes. But basic uh, things about it is that the job is done in some kind of uh, separate, separate processes. And the example uh, of that can be just transforming some video. Let's say that we modify uh, the case from the previous example once again, and in instead of taking images, now we take some uh, video, we want to parse it, so chop it, in chop it into the uh, frames, then decode it, apply convolution on them, encode it, and save them to the file. Uh, and we can use memory for that or anything. But there comes the hard part. So the hard part is communicating between those producer-consumers nodes. Uh, because you can easily encounter some overflow errors or some underfetching or overfetching of this data between the nodes. Uh, this is actually the error from membrane core uh, when you get the too large buffer difference between the producers and consumer nodes. So how, you, how, how would you deal with that? So instead of pushing the buffers from, uh, the, from producers to consumers, you would want the consumers to request the buffers in the reverse way. Uh, but doing that is quite hard uh, because it ideal, ideally you want to have each element working in, uh, on all time, but with just requesting that you can have some underfetching and you can have some elements waiting for others to process this data. So when we want to use uh, pipeline processing, basically when we have a lot of siblings power and communication, when we have some shared dependencies, and when those states can be Easily evaluated, so meaning that, for example, you can read from the file in, in chunks. But doing this is quite hard, and I wouldn't recommend it when you don't have already really well built a tool for that, or you don't want to spend a lot of time on building that tool. So that's all I've got. Uh, hope it's wasn't that, that bad, uh, if you have any questions. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.